On today's episode of Hidden History, we take you back to Chile, roughly 45 years ago. And on September 11th, 1973, specifically the events leading up to and preceding that date, where Chile lost its democracy at the hands of the United States and, more specifically, Augusto Pinochet. Today, we learn a bit about him, what motivated him, who he was, and the crimes he committed. It's Hidden History. Our source material today is Ralph Miliband in the Jacobin Magazine. What happened in Chile on September 11th, yes, it was that date, 1973, did not suddenly reveal anything new about the ways in which men of power and privilege seek to protect their social order. The history of the last 150 years is spattered with such episodes. Even still, Chile has forced many people on the left some uncomfortable reflection and questions about the strategy, which is the appropriate in Western-type regimes for what is loosely called the transition to socialism. Of course, the wise men of the left and others, too, have hastened to proclaim that Chile is not France, Italy, or Britain. This is quite true. No country like any is like any other. Circumstances are always different, not only between one country and another, but between one period and another in the same country. Such wisdom makes it possible and plausible to argue that the experience of this country or period cannot provide conclusive lessons. This is also true, and as a matter of general principle, one should be suspicious of people who seem to have instant lessons for every occasion. The chances are that they... They had them pretty much well before the occasion rose and are trying to, trying to force them on you, pretty much. That is what they're trying to do. Um, all the same, and however cautiously, there are things to be learned from experience or unlearned, which comes to the same thing. Everybody said, quite rightly, that Chile, alone in Latin America, was a constitutional, parliamentary, liberal, pluralist society, which had politics not exactly like the French or the American or uh, British, but well within democratic or uh, as Marxists would call it, the bourgeoisie democratic fold. This being the case, however, as cautious as one wishes to be, uh, what happened in Chile does propose questions. Um, when Salva, Salvador Allende was elected to the presidency of Chile in September of 1970, the regime that was inaugurated was said to constitute a test case for the peaceful or parliamentary transition to socialism. As it turned out over the following years, this was something of an exaggeration. It achieved a great deal by way of economic and social reform, but in under incredibly difficult conditions, it, but it remained a deliberately moderate regime. Indeed, it did not seem far-fetched to say that the cause of his death, or at least one main cause of it, was a stubbornness of moderation. But this is a show about, um, well, Pinochet after all, so we got to start with him. He was born in the uh, seaside Chile town of Alpreso to a pretty middle-class family. His dad wanted him to be a doctor. He wanted him to grow up strong, but it wasn't working out so well in school. He was bullied. He had a weak, braying laugh. <laughs> that kind of made him sound a little bit like a donkey. That was his nickname in school. He was bullied a lot. Yeah, kind of came from a Catholic middle-class family, which played a bit of a role in his later governance. Um, but we'll get to that later on. He uh, he went through his school as really nothing much but a, a kind of a pretty good artist. His, um, do- yeah, as I said before, his dad wanted to be a doctor, but he wanted to be a soldier. So him and his mother, who absolutely adored him, uh, finally through two rejected applications, you know, only maybe the bit of 30 would have given up, and the course of Latin American history and history at large could have been changed. But the thing is, uh, he eventually did get into the military, and pretty much kind of had a little bit of a boring ride in 1933 because while World War II was going on, Chile didn't really fight in it, as you as you may have guessed. Uh, they declared um, they declared war against the Nazis only to have a lot of them come to their general area very, very soon after the war, but didn't really fight. They only really declared uh, ceremoniously. So that pretty much led to a very interesting confrontation uh, of sorts, I guess you could see after the war, when uh, Salvador Allende was running, or sorry, not Salvador Allende, we'll get, to, we'll get back to Salvador Allende in a moment, but um, as a pretty anti-communist guy, 
um, Pinochet was running these concentration camps. Um, and they were pretty much camps where, you know, obviously not in the, not as bad as the, obviously the Nazi Germany context, but it was a place where these communists were, these militant communists that had kind of risen up after the USSR had played such a role in defeating Nazi Germany. Uh, Chile's government cracked down pretty hard, putting these guys in concentration camps and making sure that they did not uh, really be treated too well. When at that time, Senator P- uh, Allende came to visit, they got in a bit of a fight uh, with Pinochet even threatening to shoot the senator, who was at uh, that time also a doctor, and still is, and was. So let's you know, kind of reverse and talk a little bit about the other character in that very contentious meeting. Um, he actually lived in the same town as Allende did as Pinochet, and on the same street as an Italian co- uh, cobbler named uh, De Marquis. Uh, and that first name there was Juan De Marquis. Um, but not only was he a cobbler, but De Marquis was an anarchist. It, kind of insane. And you can only imagine what happened there. This was obviously the point where uh, De Marquis kind of educated uh, the, at the time, teenager who... Very surprisingly, like Pinochet, his father wanted to be a doctor, his mother kind of doted on him a little bit, uh, but this was where he learned from this Italian cobbler named Domarchi on the street side. Um, he learned all about class oppression, workers' rights, the failings of capitalism, the dynamic between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and pretty much this is where he became a socialist. Not quite an anarchist, but he did become a uh, committed socialist. Uh, I ended 1933, the same year um, he joined the military, uh, Pinochet did, he Allende co-founded Chile's first Communist Party. Allende, in 1945, became one of its first elected senators, and it was while he was in office, he had his first run in with Pinochet. This was at that camp, that concentration camp, where Pinochet threatened to shoot him. The doctor didn't dwell much on the encounter, because at the time, he was running for president. But it uh, didn't really work out for him too well in 1952. He finished Ted last. He was even temporarily booted out of his own party for his awful campaign. And, uh, you know, m- you know, Michael Jordan, he didn't make his high school basketball team. Abe Lincoln was rejected from his jobs or whatever the saying goes. I don't know. I see it on, like, high school posters all the time, you know? It's, it's just one of those kind of things. So, yeah, Allende, waiting six more years, he decides to run again in 1958. He almost won. The result was painfully close as the more conservative candidate squeaked home with a mere 33,000 more votes than Allende. And his team and his uh, large army of supporters from Chile's working class came away convinced that next time they would win. Unfortunately, they hadn't counted on Fidel Castro. On January 1st, 1959, Castro overthrew Cuba's government and installed a communist dictatorship. And... The remaining countries, the countries that still had pretty strong uh, kind of, shall we say, anti-communist, just to make it really put a broad term on it, uh, they did not want to see anything like that happen in any of their countries, and neither did some of uh, another pretty big power. Let's see if you could uh, think of the the name of the uh, the power. They didn't want communism anywhere near them, especially after what happened in Cuba, either. Uh, Yeah, that was, uh, I'll give you a hint, it started with A and ended with America, baby. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was not, not good. That Red Scare continued to be a problem for him all throughout. Even his third uh, presidential run, five years after Castro uh, took power in 1964, that was also a failure. Uh, his public admiration of Castro left him a pretty far second. That should have been the end of it. I mean, come on. You know, and, uh, sorry, buddy, but three elections, you know, even Bernie Sanders, probably, I mean, probably going to give up. I mean, he's definitely going to give up after two, but um, Allende didn't get the message. He was like Sisyphus, marching up his boulder, uh, marching up with his boulder up that hill. Uh, he entered the 1970 election determined to win, to prove all the haters wrong, to get out there and become president of Chile for the Communist Party. Leaning up to the election, the conditions did seem a little bit more ripe than usual for a socialist victory. It had been a pretty rough time for Chile at that time. There had been a lot of austerity, widespread discontent, a hunger for change, and to top it off, right-wing parties had split the vote, leaving the way open for a left-wing challenger. 
and challenge he did. The result was I ended up winning 36.6% of the vote, a tiny mandate, but more than anybody else. The shock victory sent alarm bells ringing all throughout the Americas, specifically in Washington, D.C., and even more specifically in a little place called Langley, Virginia. The Nixon administration demanded the CIA stop this upstart Marxist from taking the presidency. Instead, they handed INA the keys to the Chilean White House. On October 25th, 1970, a bunch of CIA-backed right-wing paramilitaries tried to kidnap the pro-Chilean general, likely to clear the way for a coup, but they bungled the operation, killing the general and rallying the Chilean public, the Chilean establishment, and even the Chilean military to Allende's side. This is really fascinating. So pretty much the way this worked here was we had this right after the general election. Um, people were freaking out all over the uh, CIA, the White House, and the CIA neutralizing Schneider became pretty much a must-have for any coup as he opposed any intervention by the armed forces to block Andy's constitutional election, and he was pretty big in those so-called armed forces. The CIA, who considered Schneider a major stumbling block to military officers seeking to carry out a coup, uh, supplied a group of Chilean officers led by General Camilo Valenza with sterile weapons for the option which was to be blamed on Allende supporters. So they were going to try and not even really announce it within themselves. So this was just, it was supposed to be a kidnapping here. Again, keep in mind. Um, so on October 16th, uh, 1970, based on an anonymous tip for Schneider's whereabouts, the first group attempted to kidnap him from his home. The tip turned out to be false as he'd been on vacation since two days prior and didn't return to the next day. Uh, but then three days later, a group of second second group of coup plotters rolled to the general uh, Roberto Vallo, uh, equipped with tear gas grenades, attempted to grab Schneider as he left an official dinner. The attempt failed because he left in a private car and not the expected official vehicle. The failure produced an extremely significant cable from CIA headquarters in Washington to the local station asking for urgent action because headquarters must respond to during morning October 20th uh, queries at high levels, and that included payments of $50,000 each to VO and its chief associate uh, that were authorized after they made that other attempt, proving that link, again, between some of the outsider at the time forces trying to get um, stop Andrew's rise and the highest levels of the United States government. So, um, three days after that, on October 22nd, the plotters uh, attempted to kidnap Schneider. His official car was ambushed at a street intersection on the capital city uh, of Santiago. Schneider drew a gun to defend himself on a shot point blank several times. According to a report by the Ch Chilean military police, five individuals, one of whom making use of a blunt instrument similar to a sledgehammer, broke the rear window and fired at General Schneider, striking him in the region of the spleen in his left shoulder and his left wrist. He was rushed to a hospital with the wound for fatal, but he did hang on for three days uh, on October 25th. Again, this was just supposed to be a kidnapping, um, but uh, again, this, this attempt to kidnap him was because uh, Schneider was the army commander in chief and considered a constitutionalist, which in practical terms meant he would not support a coup, even if he was conservative. He was well respected by many, many factions of the country, especially the powerful. Um, and this death provoked real national outrage, causing citizens in the military to rally just uh, rally behind the just elected Allende, who was ratified by the Chilean Congress on October 24th, helping to ensure this orderly transfer of power. Uh, so military Courts in Chile found that Snyder's death was caused by two military groups, one led by Vio and one by Camilo Venezuela. Vio and Venezuela were convicted of charges of conspiring to cause a coup, and Vio was convicted of the kidnapping. Um, the lawsuit asserted that the CIA had aided both groups, but the charges were never satisfactorily proven uh, with the expectations of tens of thousands of dollars and also machine guns given to them by the CIA. Peter Kornblue, director of the National Security Archives Chile Documentation Project, asserts the CIA documents show Vio was not acting independently or unilaterally, but clearly as a co-conspirator with Valenzuela. Uh, on October 26, 1970, uh, President Eduardo Freire Montalva named General Carlos Prats as the replacement. The same. This happened around the same time that thirty-five thousand dollars were given by the CIA to the kidnappers to keep prior contact secret, maintaining the goodwill of the group, and for humanitarian reasons. So, uh, yeah, those humanitarian reasons very, very important. So, um, Schneider's family ended up later uh, filing a lawsuit against Henry Kissinger uh, that unfortunately didn't go so well. 
Um, yeah, so this really killed any attempts from the Chilean Congress, which uh, further research does show uh, was also being paid off by the CIA. Um, and that was probably uh, one of the biggest things that allowed him to be inaugurated. As previously mentioned, when Allende took office, Chile was enduring a pretty bad economic crisis. Unemployment was high, and an estimated half of the country's children under the age of 15 were suffering from malnutrition. Allende immediately implemented his socialist agenda, starting more democratic socialists, uh, kind of more, so actually more social democratic, and moving over to, you know, more towards the Marxist philosophy. Uh, he increased wages uh, and freeze prices while taking steps to reform the education system, healthcare, and government administration. In addition to nationalizing many large-scale industries and expropriated American-owned copper industries without compensation. That was not a big deal because these copper industries were a big reason why uh, not just the spread of communism, but uh, a big reason why uh, America obviously had some pretty severe business interests there. Very similar to, you know, how we see like the Dole uh, Fruit Company, or United Fruit Company, now Dole, had in uh, other countries like Guatemala, I believe, and not Nicaragua were some of the other big ones where uh, some land reform... I think, yeah, Guatemala... Um, with Jacobo Arbenz in land reform was did not did not end well for him. Um, yeah, so this pretty much solidified opposition from President Richard Nixon's administration, which increased support to his political opponents and led efforts to cut off international lines of credit to Cuba. Poor economic planning and a growing dysfunctional relationship between Allende and the Congress and some factionalism, what else within his own party... Uh, left-wing movements famously known for sticking together, uh, not the president's inability to control his own radical left wing, brought further hostility again from the middle class, though he remained popular among workers and peasants. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much how that presidency worked out. Um, and now, as for the coup, an eyewitness at the scene describes the time like this. The now infamous golpe de estado led by Chile's army general, Augusto Pinochet, had begun. On the hurried walk to the apartment, I passed small groups of campesinos, which are farmers, headed toward the city center. I learned later that they were on their way to defend President Allende, whom they saw as a champion of disenfranchised people such as themselves. Many of them would die. From the window of my third-floor apartment, I watched as Hawker Hunter jet fighters filed missiles at the downtown area where the presidential palace La Moneda stood. On the street, Carabineros, national police, and military were out in force. Uh, people rushed to the neighborhood bakery to find food, whatever they could find. Television stations ran the same images over and over, evidence of Allende's death. Many of his supporters say he was shot by soldiers. The official explanation is he committed suicide with a gun. Um, the military declared a 24-hour curfew. In the following days and weeks, the Caballeros and military burned large piles of confiscated books in the streets. Some of them publications the socialist government had subsidized in support of its cause. The leftist acquaintances used my apartment as a gathering place before they dashed for the Mexican embassy, which was offering political asylum. I hid my own pile of LPs by left-wing musical groups such as Quilapayon and Inti Illuminati Il, no, Illumani in the uh, attic of a house in the coastal town of Vina del Mar. At the university, I had been given a desk located between two warring faculty members. One was a communist, the other was a teacher at the military academy, as well as a supporter of the conservative party. Uh, their bitter rival was not unusual at the time. People often spoke of how every civic organization was down to the Animal Welfare League was divided by national politics. For me, it was this mainly an inconvenience until September 11th, when inconvenience turned to high anxiety and lawlessness. It was not a fun time, uh, really, for anybody who considered to be left... Um, at the time, so of course that pretty much ushers in the the administration of the dictator Augusto Pinochet. He was out there; people were cheering uh, as the um, president, the I guess you could call it dictator, new president, whatever, uh, hit the television and announced a twenty four hour curfew, closing of Congress, banning of political parties, banning of trade unions, and all of that. Violence was unleashed not just against Allende and members of his government, but against all those sectors of society, the workers, the peasants, the mother centers, the shantytown residents, the students who all mobilized to support Allende, but also just mobilized to be a part of society, to be an active force in a broader democratization of Chilean political life. 
There was mass-scale arrest and detentions in the days and weeks following the coup, and those then pivoted with the creation of the secret police force to target execution and detention and disappearance of leftist political militants. The MIR, the Socialists and the Communists, other leftist groups, there was a targeted effort to eliminate them. Part of what makes Chile's experience with dictatorship and repression a bit different from other Latin American countries is the number of Chileans who actually survived the clandestine torture chambers. Official Truth Commission reports acknowledge that 3,200 Chilean um, citizens were executed or murdered by the regime, but 38,000 political prisoners who survived detention and torture, and another estimated 100,000 experienced shorter detention periods and mass raids on their working-class communities. I think the level of violence also meant that Chileans started to believe some of the narratives that the regime propagated about why this was necessary. People needed a narrative to make sense of why this was happening, and so with the time, they started to believe that some of these leftist groups hadn't just been the local school teacher, the local mayor, or the baker. They had actually been part of these subversive terrorist elements. That culture of fear worked its way into the fabric of Chilean society during 17 years of military dictatorship. Chile's dictatorship lasted much longer than most other military dictatorships in power in South America at the time. And I think one of the biggest things here is that really coming to terms with this legacy, the fact that we are like the the big part of this and it's, it's, it's I think plays a role into uh, a lot of the debates going on right now about like patriotism, how we see our country, if it's worth uh, being proud of our country, and if so, on what terms. And I definitely think it's worth getting to and considering that. Um, but like, it's important to acknowledge the role and the pain that we wrought on other parts of the world. Like, you, if you're talking about massive amounts of people, just terror being inflicted on countries all through South America. Believe me, Chile was not the only one, especially with the CIA had such a big role, just doing awful blood curling things, destroying perfectly fine democratic societies, and then uh, portraying itself as, you know, the last free standing democracy in the world. Like, that is a legacy that the U.S. has to deal with. And saying it's there should not be a crime, should not be any kind of a negative, scary thing that should cast you out of society as, you know, I think a lot of people are pushing to, to only view America through these uh, like kind of rose-colored glasses. I think that's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. All this time, every move I had made was in line with the Chilean constitution. A socialist he may have been, but a burgeoning tyrant he was not. Henry Kissinger said the biggest danger with Allende was not that he was failing, but that he wasn't. A socialist he may have been, um, it really is important to keep in mind this relationship as this tragic, bloody story plays out. By 1972, Allende's government was unpopular. An attempt to shore up support, the socialist president invited military men into his cabinet. Among them was Carlos Prats, the leading constitutionalist in the Chilean military. Prats was not happy with Allende, but was even less happy with the idea the army should remove, remove him from power. So long as Prats was running the army, there was no chance of a coup in Chile. We know this because on the 29th of July, 1973, a bunch of disaffected officers tried to stage one. It was known as the Tank Tasso because most of these involved uh, attacks on the president's residence, La Moneda, in tanks, which were pretty much a monumental failure. This was kind of leading up to the, uh, or leading up to the coup more and more, um, when Pinochet got win, he made sure his garrison came out on Allende's side. He was in the military at the time. There's actually footage from this era that appeared in the documentary, The Battle of Chile, for Salvador, Salvador Allende striding down the streets of Santiago in the coup's aftermath with Augusto Pinochet loyally at his side. Pretty crazy. It was at that very moment that convinced Carlos Prats that Pinochet was on the constitutional side. So when Prats resigned a month later, he made sure Pinochet replaced him. And so it was that, on October 22nd, 1973, Augusto Pinochet became head of the Chilean Armed Forces. When most Chilean heard this, they were kind of like, what? That guy? He thought he was kind of weird. Even Pinochet's wife thought he was joking, but it was no joke. It was a decision that would soon destroy Chilean democracy. Pinochet would boast that he'd been plotting a coup against socialism for more than a year once he gained power, but others would just paint a picture of not really a cunning man waiting for his chance, but a nobody who accidentally got wound up heading a conspiracy. On September 8th, Chile's other generals confronted Pinochet with, while no record exists of this confrontation, it seems they basically said, look, 
we're going to overthrow Allende and you too if you stand in our way. Now, are you in or are you out? And it turned out Pinochet was very much in. On September 11, 1973, the resident of Santiago awoke to earth-shaking thuds of explosions. And that was, of course, those military fighter jets that eyewitness spoke of. Um, new plumes of smoke through from uh, just spiraled down from the clear blue sky. Imagine watching on TV as the White House is consumed by flames, knowing those burning it are American soldiers. That that would make the Capitol riot seem like the playdate Republicans think it is. Um, it was a great historical ir- irony, really, that I and his first reaction to the coup, uh, really, as he got underway, was to mutter, I wonder what they've done with poor Pinochet. He had no way of knowing. The man he thought it was the last army man loyal to him was directing the bombs raining down on him. Andy's last stand today is legendary. Armed with the Kalashnikov gun given to him by Fidel Castro, he and his entourage managed to hold off the Chilean army for hours. But there was only one way this could ever end. As soldiers swarmed the flaming ruins of La Moneda, Dr. Salvador Allende shot himself in the head at 65. Out on the street of Santiago, leftist protesters were, and artists and intellectuals were being rounded up and marched to the intermittent camps we talked about earlier that were springing up across the city. Most notoriously, this included National Stadium, where dissidents were being tortured in locker rooms before being dragged down onto the pitch and shot in the head, almost like Taliban style. Uh, at the same time, announcements were going out that Chile was now under the control of a four-man military junta headed by Pinochet. As the shockwaves of the coup spread out, the old constitutionalist general, Carlos Prats, slipped out of Santiago for Argentina. Yet, the man who had made Pinochet wouldn't be able to outrun his erstwhile friend for long. On September 30th, just days after he took power, a car bomb killed Prats and his wife in Buenos Aires. It's thought Pinochet himself ordered the assassination. Back in Santiago, the junta is instituted a reign of repression. Political parties were banned. Censorship put in place. All leftist media shut down. Around 80,000 people were arrested. 200,000 forced into exile. Not that the junta itself lasted long. On October 27, 1974, just 10 months after the coup, Pinochet uses clout with the army to force the other junta leaders to step aside. In their place, he himself had elevated to supreme chief of the nation. The long tradition of democratic rule in Chile, the oldest democratic rule in Latin America, had come to an end. For the next 16 years, the donkey, once called by his uh, elementary school classmate, would reign the nation as undisputed king. And I think it's really interesting that people don't quite take into account the fact that in the end of the day, Apologize there, a bit of a microphone malfunction. But what they don't take account in, in is at the end of the day, um, he was what an incredibly repressive person, but someone who governed like really someone from the University of Chicago. In fact, he was called a Chicago boy because he learned his kind of a, a neoliberal, and this really was the birth of neoliberalism, this kind of cutting that we see, this kind of, it wasn't really like social conservatism, but this, uh, or social liberalism, liberalism, like, you know, some neoliberals we see today. But what you did see with um, Pinochet's reign was this kind of real economic opening up to privatization and just making sure that the state gradually had no power and that every facet of life was, again, gradually being uh, taken over and this kind of very Chicago school style of politics. Um, and the big thing here, most important, I think, to remember about the Chicago boys is how friendly they were to business interests, particularly American business interests. They definitely opened it up. They created, you know, a lot of economic activity that you see uh, a lot of, you know, high high brow smart economists talk about nonstop. You know, there's so, so much economic activity going on. You know, the Heritage Foundation today credits them with transforming Chile into Latin America's best performing economy. But the other side of that is that these policies, uh, such as Nobel laureate uh, Amartya Sen has argued that these policies were deliberately intended to serve the interests of American corporations at the expense of Latin American populations, a great motivation for this coup. Um, but there, you have this kind of neoliberal economic style, this kind of opening up to business interest and privatization, um, really run by, in large part, American ideas and American philosophies. Um, 
of course, they did have Chicago University did have a your university, whatever you Chicago had a campus affiliate campus in Santiago, so that did help quite a bit. Um, yeah, so one of the big things that he did while this had this neoliberal economic thing was brutal state repression of opponents. <clears throat> It was known as the Caravan of Death. This unit traveled the vast length of Chile's deserts and wastelands, flying into small towns and executing anybody who opposed military rule. All told, 97 Chileans were murdered by the caravan. In some cases, they were flown far out in the Pacific in helicopters and simply hurled to their fates. Very, very famous when you think of Pierre and Shea. Uh, meanwhile, those who had arrested, been arrested in the aftermath of the coup were funneled into concentration camps out in the dry Atacama Desert. Old saltpeter works were turned into centers where leftists were worked to death or executed by, uh, by being blown up with dynamite. Similar camps appeared in the frozen wastes of the Patagonia. But the worst new regime's torture centers were right in its capital. Very ominously, the Villa Grimaldi was once a grand colonial house. Now, it became a monument to mankind's worst impulses. All the still awful but normal end-of-the-scale prisoners were suffocated to the point of death and released. At the nasty end, the teenage daughters of regime critics were kidnapped and, as practice for soldiers learning the ropes of electroshock, used as practice for soldiers learning the ropes of electroshock torture. Probably the most strange of all, some female prisoners were forced to have intercourse with animals where the guards watched and laughed. Pretty horrifying stuff. It was a really uh, awful, awful coup. But the thing is, it wasn't just confined to Chile. In November 1975, Pinochet's secret police, the DINA, made contact with the dictatorship of Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, later including Argentina in the March 19th. After the March 1976 military coup, together they came up with something called Operation Condor, and that was to really wipe leftists off the planet. Um, the idea was that the DINA would pass information on Chilean distance to other Condor nations and vice versa. They would disappear one of those enemies. Uh, for the 60,000 people uh, killed by Condor, that meant being dropped into deep lakes or rivers or shot or buried in remote mass graves no one would ever find. Sometimes, though, it meant an even more dramatic end. One of them who had probably, I would say, a more dramatic end was the uh, foreign minister, former foreign minister for Allende, Orlando Le Tyler. He, he got into his car at Washington, D.C., where he'd been living in exile since the coup. With him was a 25-year-old U.S. citizen named Ronnie Moffitt. And at 9.30 a.m., a bomb concealed in the car exploded, killing both occupants. Even the American capital wasn't safe from Dina's reach. And, of course, you can make your, I think, fair speculations about the U.S. role in all of this. The terror only strengthened Pinochet's grip on power. As the 1980s dawned, the Chilean tyrant rammed through a new constitution, giving himself eight-year terms as president. Come 1988... There would be a yes or no referendum on whether Pinochet could keep power. Until then, he would be the one-man ruler of Chile, and the dictatorship was here to stay. And you may wonder why they were allowed to kind of exist on a friendly international scale. That's the reason. Here, here is the reason. The miracle of Chile. That was the name given by free market economists Milton Friedman to what happened and in Chile after Pinochet seized power. Under successive governments, Chile's economy had been struggling badly during Andy's office, years in office. Uh, um, things had only gotten worse. Well, the, it is, though, the subject of argument with those due to the left-wing politics or to CIA sabotage. Of course, you can probably guess where, uh, but based on their previously conceived politics, as we told you at the start, where they would fall on that. Um, when Pinochet took over, he tried to decide, again, a new route, mount, route mapped out by the Chicago boys, um, which was a big and probably the most significant domestic policy, you know, non-murdering you know murdering people factor of his leadership. By the way, this information here is from biographics uh, on Pinochet here. Um, but, yeah, biographics, I guess that's how you would say it. Um, so pretty much in the second half of the 1970s, this is why it got so much adulation and praise by the economist Milton Friedman. And that ideology, by the way, was so prominent in the U.S. and, by the way, so prominent in the, the global establishment stage. Um, the It was really a incredibly roller coaster uh, ride because it was pretty much the biggest laboratory for free market politics in history. Everything that was bolted down was privatized. 
or wasn't bolted down, was privatized, and everything opened up to the market. And again, these mass businesses. Uh, by the time 1988 had arrived, that wild ride was over. Chile's economy was the most stable in Latin America. Chile was rich, and Pinochet supporters still pointed this as a signature achievement. It certainly won the regime friends with another uh, similar-minded politician, Margaret Thatcher, openly talking of her admiration for Pinochet. But even here, we should note some caution. Chile today is successful, but it has one of the highest levels of inequality in the world. The Chicago Boys may have made Chile rich on paper and as a country, but not all share the same glory. Come 1988, Pinochet was riding high, the economy was doing great, all his enemies were dead, so he was secure in power. So when it came time to holding that referendum, was mentioned earlier, uh, Pinochet went ahead and held it. Despite all the abuses, he thought he was popular. How could the hero who delivered Chile from socialism lose? But if Pinochet thought he was a hero, Chile's electorate was still about to prove him to him that they saw him as a donkey. On the 5th of October 1988, the plebiscite returned a shock result. The pro-Pinochet side had scraped a mere 44% of the vote. The anti-Pinochet side had run by 12 points. The next day, an outraged Pinochet called his generals to his office and declared he would never stand down. The vote was a fix. It was all miserable. The generals knew something the old donkey didn't know. They knew the U.S. was already piling on pressure that Pinochet would have to honor this result or face international consequences. One by one, they refused to back down. So Pinochet ended his presidency. And, of course, was uh, arrested in London later on. You know, that's, that's a whole other story. Still dealing with the legacy of Chile's uh, and the repression of Pinochet to this day. But one of the biggest things that he left behind was the, the crazy thing is he got too confident. He literally just got too confident, decided to open himself up to a referendum when, you know, let's be honest, he probably would have got away with not having one if he just hadn't brought it up in the first place. Um, he had one and he had to resign. This ended a period of brutal repression of any kind of uh, left-wing ideas. And as we talked about economically, the repression of the poorest as inequality grew in Chile, despite on-paper economic success. It speaks a lot about the history of America and really what we do, uh, given our deep role in the rise and support of Pinochet and our biggest elites, like, for example, Milton Friedman, he's, he's kind of still around, have a big deal after supporting Pinochet. His ideas, let's just say, have been very, very successful and influential. Um, and that really makes you wonder, like, what was... What are the purpose? What purpose did these um, regimes that have kind of popped up all over Latin America in the Cold War period, just generally? What did they mean? What were they all about? And how should we consider them? Like, I think they're definitely a stain. Anyone would say on our legacy. Um, and, but what, how heavily do we weigh them? How does that impact our feelings about our country? That is a debate that will continue to rage for. Many years to come. I think it's getting to a pretty interesting point right now. Thank you so much for listening to Hidden History today, everybody. Catch you next week.